six counts of murder. Did you kill him? Sure I did. Why? Just one there tonight. Richard Speck was one of the most fiendish mass murderers in American history as his slayings of eight nursing students, in a single evening, captured the attention of the entire nation. On July 13, 1966, Speck unleashed his terror on Chicago by breaking into a building in the neighborhood of South Deering. At the time, this building functioned as a dormitory for student nurses. And tragically, eight women inside would meet horrific ends that night. Welcome or welcome back to True Stories, join our family in exploring some of the most twisted true crime cases. As always, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe. Now, let's get into it. Richard Benjamin Speck was born in the small city of Monmouth, Illinois to two religious, teetotaling parents in 1941. But that childhood was derailed when he was six. That year, in 1947, his 53-year-old father died from a heart attack. When his mother remarried a few years later, Speck's new stepfather was the opposite of his clean-cut idol. His stepfather was a traveling salesman with a long criminal record who would drink and verbally abuse the young Speck. With his new family, Speck moved to East Dallas, Texas, where they bounced from house to house, living in many of the poorer neighborhoods of the city. Speck was a poor student throughout school. He refused to wear the glasses that he needed and would not speak in class due to anxiety. He repeated the eighth grade and eventually dropped out the second semester of his first year of high school. By that time, Richard Speck had picked up his stepfather's drinking habit and was getting drunk almost every day. Speck held a number of regular jobs and even got married after he impregnated a 15-year-old girl he met at Texas State Fair. However, he continued to run into trouble with the law. He tattooed born to raise hell on his arm and certainly lived by that ethic. He would be arrested 41 times before the age of 24. Speck's wife, Shirley Malone, reportedly lived in fear of him. When Speck is drinking, he will fight or threaten anybody, his probation officer once reported, as long as he has a knife or gun. When he's sober or unarmed, he couldn't face down a mouse. The pockmarked wreck of nerves became a career criminal and his arrests included theft, robbery, fraud, and assault. In 1965, Speck attacked a woman in the parking lot of her apartment building with a 17-inch carving knife. Though she escaped, Speck was arrested and given a 16-month sentence. He was ultimately released after six months due to an error. Fearing for her life, Speck's wife filed for divorce and took full custody of their child. Speck's violence only escalated from there. After moving back to Monmouth to live with his sister, he stabbed a man in a bar fight, stole a car, and robbed a grocery store, then burgled, tortured, and sexually assault. A 65-year-old woman in her home. Speck then killed a 32-year-old barmaid who worked at a bar he was doing carpentry work for. After being questioned for this murder, Speck skipped town and moved in with another one of his sisters in Chicago. By July of that year, Speck had outstayed his welcome and attempted to get a job on a ship with the National Maritime Union. He stayed there for five days awaiting a shipping assignment and in that time, committed the worst of his crimes. On July 12, after receiving an assignment, Speck arrived at the ship, only to find his position had been given to someone else. Enraged, Speck embarked on a drinking spree in the neighborhood. On his binge, Speck met Ella May Hooper, a 53-year-old woman who had spent the day drinking at the same taverns as him who he then held up at knife point. Armed now, Speck set out into the streets of the south side of Chicago. After a mile, he came across a townhouse that was functioning as a dormitory for nine student nurses at the South Chicago Community Hospital. Speck broke in through the window of the townhouse at 11 p.m. on July 13, 1966, and made his way to the bedrooms. He knocked first on the door of Filipina exchange student nurse Corazon Amurao, 23, and, at gunpoint, herded her and her fellow exchange students from the Philippines, Merlita Gargullo, 23, and Valentina Pajan, 23, into the next room, where American students Patricia Machusek, 20, Pamela Wilkening, 20, and Nina Jo Schmale, 24, were sleeping. Speck then woke up the Americans and tied all six girls' wrists behind their backs with strips of torn bedsheets. Amurao, the lone survivor of the encounter, later said, the American girls told us we more or less had to trust him. Maybe if we were calm, and quiet he will be too. He has been talking to us all, and he seems calm enough, and that is a good sign. Instead, Speck then led them one by one out of the room, and then stabbed or strangled each of the women to death. Amurao said that none of her friends screamed as they were being led from the room, but she later heard their muffled cries. While Speck's back was turned, Amurao rolled under a bed in the room. 
In the midst of this carnage, two other student nurses who lived in the dormitory arrived home. First came Suzanne Ferris, 21, who Speck stabbed to death in the upstairs hallway as she was walking to her room. Likely because of these late arrivals, Speck must have lost count of how many women he had tied up as he forgot about Amurao. She stayed hidden under the bed until 6 a.m. for safe measure, hours after Speck had finished his rampage. Amurao bolted from her hiding place to the nearest window, from where she screamed, they are all dead. My friends are all dead. Oh God, I'm the only one alive. Though Speck had fled, he was easily recognized after he went to a hospital a few days later, and a doctor noticed his tattoo after reading about it in a newspaper. Speck was placed on trial for the murders after a panel of psychiatrists chosen by both his defense and his prosecution judged him competent to do so. During his trial, which began on April 3, 1967, Speck claimed to have no recollection of the murders, something that did not bother the prosecution, as they already had an eyewitness ready to identify him. Amurao took to the witness stand for the trial and in a dramatic moment stood directly in front of Richard Speck, pointed at him, almost touching his chest, and said, this is the man. The prosecution also found fingerprints matching Speck's prints at the scene of the crime. The trial of Speck was a national sensation. It was one of the first times in 20th century American history that someone had killed so many people at random. After only 45 minutes of deliberation, the jury came back with a guilty verdict for Speck. He was initially given a death sentence, but this was reduced to life in prison in 1971, when the Supreme Court ruled that people opposed to the death penalty were unconstitutionally excluded from the jury. Speck served the sentence at Stateville Correctional Center in Illinois. Richard Speck died on December 5, 1991, the eve of his 50th birthday, from a heart attack. We've come to the end, thank you for watching. Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe. Till next time.